across planet internet, self-appointed scientists are filming outrageous acts of science. These internet heroes are doing bizarre experiments, making extraordinary inventions, and creating amazing scientific stunts. We've gathered a team of top science brains to analyze just how they do it, why they do it, and choose the very best. It's science, but not as you know it. So stand back and don't even think about trying this at home. No, we mean that. In this episode, we pay homage to the masters of the universe. Those intrepid uploaders who push the envelope of the possible and stand fearless in the face of natural forces. I'm looking for people who will take on a fundamental force of nature and win. I'm looking for people that can channel the forces of nature to create something epic. You have to prove to me that you have command over the laws of physics and that you can bend nature to your will. So now we know what it takes to be a master of the universe. Let the excellence begin at number 20. November 24, 2012. We're in Walvis Bay on the coast of Namibia. As the revolutionary new Sail Rocket 2 hits an average speed of 75 miles per hour over 500 yards, making it the world's fastest sailboat. The boat is piloted by Australian Paul Larson, who's now officially a master of the universe. Absolutely amazing engineering. To get this kind of speed up on the water takes exceptional skill in design. But it wasn't smooth sailing for Paul after more than a decade of testing. There's always a risk element when you're, you're taking out craft, especially ones quite radical like this, and you're pushing them to the limit. That's your job. Each time we went faster, the crashes got bigger and bigger. And sometimes sitting in that boat, knowing that what could happen in the next 15 seconds could be a world record or kill you, was something that I, I came to terms with. Years of development finally paid off. But what exactly makes this thing so fast? One of the ways they've made this a much faster boat is by making it closer to an airplane. So they designed the sail to be more like a wing. It's actually angled at about 30 degrees. And so when air is flowing over it, you get a force pushing up on it. And what that's doing is helping keep the whole boat up out of the water. And when you're up out of the water, you get a lot less drag in the water and you'll move a lot faster. And why did they choose a bizarre design? Why not use a normal sailboat? The fundamental difference between this boat and a normal sailboat is a normal sailboat, at a certain wind pressure, it can't take anymore, and it just heels over. The higher the wind, the more the boat tilts over, and the less you can harness that wind energy. So unfortunately, with the current way sailboats are designed, you can never really get above 50 knots. So how do they get above 70 miles per hour? What they've done is move the sail and the keel to completely different sides. You can see the whole boat is stretched right out. So where a traditional sailboat would tend to tip over in these type of winds, this platform is extremely stable. It can take more and more wind, and there is basically no limit to how fast it can go. Ah, so a special sail plus a stretch design equals a super fast sailboat. In your mind for 11 years, you always thought, what's it going to feel like to be number one? And after 11 years, it was just a huge relief. Gravity is generally the enemy of fun, keeping us on the ground. But if you're a master of the universe, you can beat it with simple physics and a hammer. I don't know if these guys realized uh, there's some really great physics going on here. Anything is possible, so what's going on here? The force, which is going uh, around, keeping him in motion, is, uh, is a special force, a centripetal force. So how does centripetal force work? Gravity is trying to pull him down onto the ground. Now, if he's spinning fast enough, he'll be pushed out into the walls of the hammock, and this will allow him to overcome the pull of gravity. Another way to think 
of this is as he's going around the circle, it's like he wants to fly out, but the hammock is constantly catching him and pushing him back. <laughs> and exactly what does it do to the man in the hammock? The swinging hammock is actually very similar to a roller coaster ride. So at the top of the loop, he's going to be a bit lighter than his own weight. But at the bottom, he's going to be five times his own weight, which means he's going to be pretty squished against the hammock. But it's okay, though, because it's only for a brief instant. And remember, hammocks are really designed for sleeping, so don't try this at home. <laughs> now it's time to enter a parallel universe. The thing about this clip that was really sort of like the weird, eerie, disturbing thing is that it totally looks like something from a Halloween film. Filmmaker Paul Bates shot this bizarre footage when visiting his grandfather's grave in England. It's really, really creepy. But actually, it's just a natural biological phenomenon. So who or what is behind this weird webbing we're seeing? These webs are made by a caterpillar called the bird cherry ermine moth. And it's named that because it likes to eat the bird cherry trees, of which there are many growing in this graveyard. These webs actually come out of the caterpillar's mouths. They spin it with the salivary glands. They take amino acids from the food that they eat and from old recycled webs, and they spin these proteins into this big new web. And why are they taking over the entire cemetery with their super silk making skills? Her crop of larvae has hatched and they have run out of bird cherry tree leaves and so they've actually ended up spinning this silk all over the place as they look for food they do this for protection and it protects them from predators that might otherwise swoop in and take them this is norwegian driver ule christian rustan now if he offers you a lift say no He's a master at driving up almost vertical cliffs. It looks like it should be impossible. This is extreme driving. So why isn't the car flipping backwards off the cliff? Now things flip when the center of gravity goes beyond the pivot point. So if you take my arm here as the vehicle, and this is one tire here, and this is the other tire here, if the center of gravity is quite high, if it's up here, you can see if it goes past the first tire, it's going to flip all the way because the center of gravity has gone beyond that pivot point. And that's incredibly important. A low center of gravity is key. Okay, so they have a low center of gravity, but what else is special about these cars? To maximize the friction, you need big tires with big treads and as much surface area as possible. The tires are also going to be partially deflated, which means you'll get a large surface area so that they can grip into the surface of the cliff. And listen to that sound. What's going on under the hood? You need a really powerful motor that can operate in a low gear without stalling because halfway up a mountain that is the last thing you need so it's all about friction center of gravity and power but don't try this unless you have a special cliff climbing car okay good so far our masters of the universe have harnessed the power of the wind the magic of centripetal force and defy gravity but coming up, we'll find out why this bowling ball thinks it's a balloon. The science behind an amazing jump. And discover what makes this guru a master. All this and more, coming up on Outrageous Acts of Science. Welcome back to our countdown of the Internet's Masters of the Universe. And as we enter our top 15, prepare to embark on our non-stop flight to science country. Okay, warning. Our next clip contains radiation, and in some forms it's terrifying and lethal. But that didn't stop BioNerd, a medical physicist from Germany. In this clip, she took a Geiger counter on a plane. And when she reached a height of seven miles, the reading was 26 times higher than on the ground. It surprised me to see how much radiation there was in the cabin as the flight went higher and higher. I have no idea if it's safe. I'd like to know if it is. We went to Berlin, Germany to ask BioNerd herself. I think radiation is widely misunderstood. I filmed it because I wanted people to, to see um, that they're actually exposing themselves to quite high ambient radiation levels if they're flying. I want to educate people about this. 
So what kind of radiation is this? What BioLord is detecting using her radiation detector is actually the background radiation which is all around us all the time. It's coming from our sun, it's coming from our galaxy, it's coming from galaxies far, far beyond our galaxy, and it's crashing into the atmosphere, and there it's creating even more radiation. It consists of a whole bunch of different phenomena, from alpha particles, protons, to cosmic rays, and they create ionization, which is detected by this radiation detector. And why does it increase as you get higher up? When BioNerd's on the ground, she is shielded from the cosmic radiation by our atmosphere. As she takes off, she gets higher and higher, and the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner, thus exposing her to more of this cosmic radiation. So should we all wear radiation suits on a long flight? To put this into a bit of perspective, your average nuclear industry worker has an annual exposure limit. To reach that just by flying, you would have to constantly be flying in the air for 321 days of the year. September 2012 at a secret test facility. And stunt driver Brent Fletcher's buggy break the world record and complete a 90-foot corkscrew jump between two ramps. This corkscrew jump looks amazing. So how did Brent master the laws of physics and sneer at gravity? It's key that this is a very precision design ramp here. They designed the ramps to be at 65 degree angles. So when the car takes off, it twists in the air. The landing ramp has a 65 degree angle too, which means that the car can land at that angle and be brought back onto the flat. And what speed did the driver have to hit to nail the jump? If you run the numbers, you'll see that the guy traveled at about 54 miles per hour, which is about 87 kilometers per hour. It turns out that he was only in the air for about 1.01 seconds. So there's not a lot of time to get this wrong. So precision engineering and precise driving make Brad Fletcher a master of the universe. Take a deep breath. And brace yourself for yoga master Rishi. I was really weirded out when I saw this guy. I don't know what he's doing. This is an astonishing thing to look at. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite this extreme before. When it comes to abdominal athleticism, yoga master Rishi from Toronto, Canada is your man. This yogic practice is called Nauli. It's said to cleanse you from within, and it's almost impossible to do. But just how does Rishi turn his six-pack into a writhing cat? So what this guy is doing is actually breathing out. So his diaphragm goes upwards really high into his chest. All the other organs that are attached to that are being pulled up there as well. Once he's got all those organs kind of out of the way, what you've got left is this strip of muscle, which is what your six-pack's made of. But... In this, in this case, there's no fat on top of it. It's very well toned, but he's got incredible control over it. And for me, that's actually the most impressive bit. He's able to control that by contracting and relaxing the muscles in a pattern. He's able to get it rippling around uh, in a circular way in both directions too, which is really nice. It's disturbing, but it's also impressive. It's the most active six pack you'll ever see. Stick around for more Masters of the Universe on Outrageous Acts of Science. At number 13 in our countdown, let's join 30 top skiers in Quebec, Canada, where they're about to attempt the world record for performing a mass backflip on skis. I was convinced that someone was going to bail. There was no way that they were going to get all 30 people to do a backflip at the same time holding hands, but somehow they managed it, and that is really, really impressive. But why doesn't the massive jump end in complete carnage? All the skiers are slightly different. They're all going to go at different speeds. They're going to flip slightly differently. The great thing, though, is they're not just inanimate objects. They can make minor corrections. If you want to spin a little bit slower, you have to stretch yourself out. If you want to speed up your spin, you need to pull your legs in and make yourself smaller. That sounds easy, but they all landed at different times and almost wiped out. 
If any one of those people causes a perturbation through the system in a negative way, that could cause a whole cascading effect that would take down the entire line of skiers. So how is it possible for the string of skiers to stay together? With 30 people in a row, if each person's wrist just goes 6 degrees across the whole row, that's 180 degrees in total. That's enough for one guy to be upside down before the other guy's even left the jump. Scientific proof that the incredible human machine can accomplish almost anything. <laughs> master of the material universe. The internet has been melting with almost half a million hits for Max Prinsky's demonstrating the world's most wonderful material. Without pressure, it just melts through the ice. He has just taken his own body heat and used it to carve through ice like it was butter. This is my absolute favorite clip because it contains my personal favorite material, graphene. And what is this wonder stuff? carbon in form of graphite in things like pencils. Now graphene is one single atom thick layer of exactly the same substance. What Max has got here is something called pyrolytic graphite and this is where you take single layers of graphene and then you stack these layers on top of each other so you get something that's about a quarter of an inch thick. What this material is really good at is conducting heat. So if heat is essentially atoms vibrating quickly then how is the heat getting from his hand to the ice cube? If we could look in and see the atoms in this material, then the atoms that were next to Max's hands would be vibrating very quickly. And because of this highly ordered structure, one atom would then bump into the next atom and would transfer these vibrations straight down the material really quickly, transferring this energy to the ice cube. Okay, Zujata, let's see how hot your fingers are. Now, all I'm gonna do, I'm not even gonna apply much pressure. That is the weirdest thing. This is just sliding through like a knife through butter. Oh, wow. Oh, this is so cool. Sorry, I'm geeking out a bit now. Take this away from me. I really wanna. Mike Baum and his skydiving buddies are about to turn a heavy bowling ball into a lightweight balloon. This bowling ball looks weightless, right? It's, it looks so easy to just push it back and forth instead of this really heavy mass. So it just looks really beautiful and elegant. What's the physics behind this free-falling ball? Air resistance changes the rate at which two different size objects fall through the air. Now, a bowling ball should slip through the air quite easily. It should fall faster than they are. In the case of a man, he's a much larger object than a ball. So he's going to experience a much larger air resistance on his body, and that's why he would be falling a lot slower than a bowling ball. So how do they slow down the bowling ball so they're all falling at the same speed? They attach streamers to that bowling ball, which creates a drag air resistance force that keeps the ball in line, falling at the same rate with all the flying men. Without the streamers, it would actually slip through the air and fall much faster. If they get to the ground and there are no bowling pins there waiting for that ball, they've missed an opportunity. So far, our scientists have been astonished by what they've seen, as our masters of the universe have battled the forces of nature and pushed the body to its limit. But as we enter the top ten, it's time to stand back. I have heard that if you keep your eyes open while sneezing, your eyeballs can pop out. Meet Eric Ludwig from San Francisco. He's the best person to test this theory because he can make himself sneeze. Yeah, Eric sneezes on command. <laughs> yes, his eyeball stayed in. How exactly does he make himself sneeze? Eric has a sneeze button. <laughs> A sneeze button? How does a sneeze button work? <laughs> what Eric's effectively doing is stimulating his trigeminal nerve to cause himself to sneeze. The trigeminal nerve is the largest nerve in the face, and it sends a signal to the sneezing center of the brain that tells you to sneeze. And usually that nerve is stimulated by something like dust or pollen. Once Eric triggers the sneeze button, he's basically telling his nose initially that there's something in here, some sort of foreign matter, which then tells his brain we need to get it out. <laughs> which is a perfectly natural reaction. He's just got the ability to yeah, set it off whenever he wants. How did you discover you could do that? I had my nose when I was a little kid. Oh, and by the way, why didn't his eyeballs pop out? Luckily for Eric, the whole thing about your eyes flying out is a myth. 
Your eyes are attached with several strong muscles sitting inside of your head. They're not going anywhere. I'd like to thank Eric for putting this myth to bed for once and for all that you don't need to close your eyes when sneezing. <laughs> Perhaps next time, maybe maybe just cover your, your nose while you're doing it. So far, our scientists have been wowed by a corkscrew and car, a plummeting bowling ball, and the genius of graphene. But things are about to get even more glorious when we return with more Masters of the Universe. to our countdown of the top 20 masters of the universe. So far, we've been flipped, flopped, and had our stomachs churned. But we're about to find out why this man has more dates than anyone alive. Hey, you ever wish you could remember important dates? Then you need Steve Ellison. He's a master at remembering when famous people were born and died. 1969 to 1967. Uh, 1989, 1977. This is Charlie Tucker. Yes. 1869 to 1969. Yeah. 1969 to 1969. Yeah. 1969 to 1969. Yeah. That's something I've always been pretty good at. I'd, I'd call it a gift more than anything else. I'm studying on 2008 is Heath Ledger. I just thought it'd be nice to know. I just started looking up people on Wikipedia, remembering their year of birth and year of death. So how does Steve memorize and recall thousands of days? I'd say two years, put them together to make the eight-digit number. That then gets translated into a pattern in my head, and somewhere in that pattern lies the person that I've attached to that. And where does Steve's brain keep all this information? I mean, we can't even remember what we had for breakfast. Nice. Uh, hang on, I can get this. Is it John Steinbeck? Yeah. Nice. Good, hard one, hard one. You have a short-term uh, memory and a, a longer-term memory. And short-term memory is very short-term. Um, things need to pass through that very quickly indeed. At the very beginning, when you start to learn something new on Steve and his digit numbers, this information is stored in the front part of the cortex, whereas long-term memory is stored in the hippocampus and in the cortex. So you have to transform this information. And how you do this is by practicing it over and over and over again. And then the brain starts to build up new connections. He's practicing these dates and these people over and over and over again until he's physically changed what's going on in his brain. It's a huge network, very complicated. We don't really know how exactly it works. 1874 died 1965. I want him to go one better. I want him to predict people's death dates. Now that would be more useful. Ever wondered whether a little gummy bear can protect a big gummy bear from a bullet? Well, Jeff from California did and uploaded this bizarre video to the web. What kind of man shoots an innocent little gummy bear? A scientist who wants to know what's going to happen. see any holes in it. There's the little gummy bear. Lots of damage. I did not expect this. The bullet was right on the surface of the gummy bear. What's so special about this gummy candy? The gummy bear is made out of corn syrup, and this is incredibly dense. Now, dense things will help slow down bullets on their own, but there's a second thing at play here, which is gelatin. Gelatin is a long-chain protein that's derived from the connective tissue of animals. Now, the gelatin creates this kind of network, this matrix, filled with pockets of corn syrup. How does this matrix of corn syrup and gelatin stop a bullet? The reason this matrix of protein stops the bullet is because it spreads out the force of impact across the entire network of protein. Rather than having the energy propagate forwards through the gummy bear, what happens is the matrix with the corn syrup can dissipate the energy sideways, stopping the bullet from actually going too far forward and actually protecting anything behind it. This protein network is actually similar to a real bulletproof vest because there are fibers which spread the impact of a bullet across the entirety of the vest. So what does that mean? This could be the beginning of something big. We could go from gummy bear body armor to licorice helmets to chocolate peanut bomb shelters. Who knows? Right, Bucky. Sure. <laughs> 
before you watch this, remember never, ever try this. Meet Master of Madness, Mustang One. A 25-year-old Ukrainian who loves long walks. 850 feet up in the air and posting about it on the internet. He's crazy. Why would you do something like that? This is not something anybody at home should imitate. If he falls, he will die. So how does he manage to keep his balance over 800 feet off the ground? There are actually three biological systems that contribute to balance. First of all, the vestibular system in our inner ear. And this allows us to detect the direction of gravity. And so when you've done a lot of spinning, you've kind of disrupted your vestibular system. And you're not able to balance quite as well. The second is the proprioception system, which essentially monitors each part of the body. It's a body's way of knowing where every body part is in relation to every other body part. And the third is our vision. Our eyes give us clues about where our body is located with respect to other objects around it. And this is very important to be able to orient ourselves properly. So why would most people find it hard to balance on a narrow pipe 850 feet above the ground? Mustang has very clearly become habituated to this level of adrenaline that he has while he's up there. Most of us would look down and we'd freak out. But for him, this is perfectly normal. On outrageous acts of science, it's our job to warn you about dangerous and bad ideas. So don't even think about doing any of this. Want to be a master of the universe and make your own anti-gravity machine? Then watch this. Meet the levitating spinning top, invented by Michael from Poland, who is definitely a master of internet science. He has defied gravity. Just seems like magic. This had to be in my top ten. This is physics at its best. So how do you make one of these awesome anti-gravity gizmos? What's happening here is that they have a circular magnet on the bottom, and it has one pole facing up, and the little magnet has its pole facing in the opposite direction, and so these two magnets repel. And it's important that they're circular because they have this symmetric magnetic field. But why does he spin the smaller magnet? If you just place that spinning top magnet above these circular magnets, even with the poles pointed in opposite directions, it would flip really rapidly and would be attracted to the larger magnet. Once he spins it, now there's a new force that comes in. And this is a conservation law. Whenever you have a spinning object, it always wants to keep its axis pointed in the same direction. And so that provides a stability that prevents it from flipping over. Just two magnets and a bit of spin make this gravity-busting, levitating master of the universe. After the break, more outrageous acts of science. So far in our list of masters of the universe, we've met the Memory Man, a bulletproof gummy bear, and the world's fastest sailboat. So welcome to the top five, where we're about to redefine what it means to be a master of the universe. Now for the weather from Bridgeport, Nebraska. It's cloudy with rain and a chance of lightning. Oh my God! The car was just struck by lightning! Storm Chaser John Persons closely observing the awesome power of a million volts of light. Oh, oh Probably one of the best things about the video is his reaction to getting hit by lightning. He absolutely freaks out. Oh, oh my God! So why has the lightning come down to Earth through John's car? In lightning, you create a large amount of voltage which is generated in the clouds and this creates a lightning bolt which feels its way to ground as it's feeling its way to ground it sees john's car with his antenna sticking out this is a great path to ground so it reroutes itself to the car and all the energy in the lightning bolt flows through the antenna through the car to ground a ham radio antenna this is what's left of it as you can see this is uh, this is pretty crap john's car is toast but why isn't he <laughs> John survives because the electricity will flow through the metal car instead of through John's body because that's a better path to ground. All human bodies are conductive, but they're not nearly as conductive as metal is. We can get hit by lightning and killed by lightning, but compared to a car, we're not very good at conducting electricity, so the car will always come worse off. So is it safe to 
safer to stay in your car during an electrical storm. The moral of the story is, if you're trapped in a thunderstorm, one of the best places to be is inside your car with the door shut. Let the lightning get the outside of your car, and it'll go away, instead of standing outside and getting hit by lightning. Meet Bird Camera from Florida. Bird has the best job in the world. He designs and flies miniature helicopters for radio-controlled model companies. When this video of Bird doing his astonishing stunts in Switzerland landed, it scored over 300,000 hits. The skill involved in this is truly unbelievable. My favorite move is when the helicopter comes crashing down really quickly, very close to the ground, and then he pushes it backwards and he saves it from his deep dive. We tracked down Bird and asked him to explain how he does it. For somebody to learn to fly the way I do, it would take anywhere between three to ten years. My favorite moves are the pyro flip, which is basically a pirouetting while the helicopter is flipping. It happens all at the same time. Another favorite maneuver is the tick-tock. And another favorite maneuver is what we call the funnel, which is basically a tail-down inverted circle. But could a full-size helicopter perform these intricate moves? The G-forces that would be experienced by a real pilot would be way too strong to be sustainable. Secondly, we have the power-to-weight ratio, which means that for a small helicopter, the engine is much more powerful, and that allows him to flip upside down and fly that way. How is Bird pulling off his amazing maneuvers? So the first control that Bert is using is the main rotor blade. First, it provides lift. The next thing it does is it can actually be tilted forwards and backwards. And by tilting it, you can make the helicopter go forwards or tilt it in the opposite direction. You can push the air out and it'll go backwards. Now, the other thing is, there's something called a swash plate. This allows the helicopter to tilt in all directions, which means he can do that sideways tilt and go nose up and nose down and do all those crazy motions. If I want the machine to move forward, I push forward here. If I want it to go right, I push right, left. And if I want to go back, I push back. So flying backwards is as simple as pushing back on this stick right here and the machine will fly backwards. So the main rotor gives the helicopter lift and moves it backward or forward. But what does the tail rotor do? Without the tail, the helicopter body would just spin around. And so this rotor blade at the back keeps it nice and level. We can also change the pitch on the tail blades by moving the stick right to left. And by changing the pitch on the tail blades, you create lift sideways, allowing the helicopter to move to one side or the other. Coming up next, it's time for our top three as outrageous acts of science pays homage to the most magnificent masters of the universe. So far on Outrageous Acts of Science, our experts have seen a corkscrewing car, an electrifying encounter, and a speed barrier busting boat. But at number three, we'll take a deep breath before jumping in. Meet Kimmy Warner, a free diver from Hawaii who loves to catch her own lunch. And when she was out catching her lunch one day off the coast of Mexico, a great white shark swam by. To my surprise, I let out a squeal and I started swimming towards her. whether it's bravery or just sheer stupidity. Everyone knows you don't just approach a great white and shake its fin. Great white sharks are formidable predators. They can be up to 16 feet or 5 meters long. Their teeth are serrated, and so they're basically for ripping and shredding. In addition to that, they have incredible senses, a great sense of smell, a great sense of vision, a great sense of hearing, and this extra sense that fish have, which allows them to detect electrical signals in the water. So they're very efficient hunters. So why isn't this one hunting Kimmy? He could eat us, but he doesn't need to. Because we are not his usual prey. When a great white does attack a human, it's likely because it is mistaking a human for a seal or a sea lion. Most great white shark attacks occur in that context. It's obviously incredibly dangerous. So why can Kimmy hitch a ride on the great white? 
She hasn't just been cavalier and leapt into the water. She's able to read the signs clearly enough to choose the time that it's best to swim with them. The shark is swimming calmly, its pectoral fins aren't down, and there isn't any other hunting going on nearby in the water. So this shark isn't about to attack. <laughs> Meet Angus, Kent, Carly, Matt, and Joel, who are about to become masters of electricity in Australia. With the help of Angus, who's a science teacher, they decided to find out what happens when you touch an electric fence. <laughs> Made me laugh so much. But it does just go to show when you shouldn't mess with electricity. So how do they achieve a simultaneous five-person electrocution? A electric fence is, is quite simply a battery, and, and a battery, of course, has two terminals. One terminal is the wires that you see as the fence, and then what they do, they get these stakes and they put them in the ground, and that makes the ground the other terminal. So if you stand on the ground and touch the electric fence, you're completing the circuit, and hence you get a shock. But why are Angus, Kent, and Carly not getting an electric shock right now while Angus touches the electric fence? It's designed to keep animals in and deliver a brief shock. Electricity will only flow if there's a path to ground. When those first initial few people touch the electric fence, they're standing on plastic chairs, so there's no path to ground. They're standing on insulating materials which don't conduct electricity, and this prevents a circuit being formed between the ground and the fence. It's only when Joel takes off his shoes and holds the hand of the last person, then the circuit is complete, and a huge pulse of electricity can flow through them all. So why do they all jump at the same time? The electric current is going to stimulate pain receptors, it's going to stimulate the nervous system, it's going to stimulate muscles, and all of this is going to be very painful. The reason these guys are more seriously injured is the fact that the electric fences deliver their electric charge in a high voltage but low current short pulse. Now, if you compare this to mains electricity, that is high current and continuous. And the thing that causes damage during electrocutions is the amount of current that flows through you. And please, don't try this at home. Electricity can be lethal. <laughs> so far in our countdown of the Internet's masters of the universe, we defy gravity using brains, brawn, and big engines. We've harnessed the awesome power of the wind and met the world's smartest substance. But now, it's time for our number one master of the universe. These guys surely have to be number one because they've done this with a ping pong ball. It's astonishing that it can make a hole like this. Meet Craig Zeri and Jim Stratton from Purdue University in Indiana. They built this ping-pong bazooka, posted some astonishing footage on the internet. Check this out. The mechanic is ridiculously fun. <laughs> it's addictive. I still giggle every time we fire it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but how can a ping-pong ball do this? Even though it's a very small mass, its velocity is so high that the ping pong ball has an incredible amount of momentum, so high that it can go through solid objects. Ping pong balls don't normally get up to these kinds of speeds because of air resistance. These students have tried to get rid of as much air as possible by creating a vacuum inside the tube. We're going to draw all the air out of this entire portion of the cannon. So we're going to draw it down to as close to a perfect vacuum as we can get. So they removed air resistance to make it go faster. But what provides the oomph? They create a pressure chamber of really highly pressured air behind the ping pong ball. We're going to pressurize this side using an air line here. Um, so this side will pressurize. When that pressure chamber is released, the air has to squeeze through a tiny nozzle and that accelerated air is what pushes the ping pong ball through the chamber and out to destroy the bat. Jimmy will throw a switch over there and now we're building pressure here. So they use compressed air to accelerate a ping pong ball through a vacuum, reaching incredible speeds. But just how fast is the ball moving? 
At that moment of impact, that ping pong ball was traveling at 1,300 kilometers per hour. That's 800 miles per hour. There's enough force to smash through the back because this is a supersonic ping pong ball. In fact, this supersonic ping pong ball is so powerful, they've used it on other things. And that makes Craig, Jim, and their professor, Mark French, outrageous acts of sciences, masters of the universe. And as they blast into number one, it's time to say goodbye. Until next time on Outrageous Acts of Science.